two, check, check, one, two. I haven't been, for the purposes of the recording, haven't been doing a microphone. I hope that recording is okay. So if we need to edit in, uh, we are on uh, number three on page two, in faith according to his will. If my audio was horrible, we'll redo that first section. So what filling did we miss? To the Father in Jesus' name was number two. Got that one? Okay. Okay. Uh, so number three was in faith according to his will. Your filling is in f is faith. In faith according to his will. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever thing you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. This is faith. You believe that you already have what you're asking for. It's mine already because... You're his child, and he delights to give you the desires of your heart. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we have asked of him. So our point earlier is, is that God invites us to make petitions because it's about relationship. Number four, in righteousness, you're filling his righteousness, in righteousness and sincerity to, to God. So how do we pray? In righteousness and sincerity to God. First Peter 3.12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Where do we get our righteousness? Get our righteousness because we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. You trying to offer your own righteousness? Your prayers, your prayers aren't heard because of your righteousness. Your prayers are heard because of his righteousness. Number five, in unity with and forgiving one another. Your filling is forgiving. Your underlying is forgiving. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For a two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. In unity with and forgiving one another. Do you think God, based on that scripture about where two or more are gathered together, he's there in their midst, and based on the scripture that says that one will put a thousand and two will put ten thousand to flight, do you think that God's heart for having unity and relationship is really important? Do you think that we have the ability to merge our faith together and that that creates a greater pull on heaven's resources to affect God's will in a situation here on earth? It does. It does. But we need to keep our relationships right with one another. That's our part. Keep, keep your relationships right with one another. Love this next scripture, Mark 11, 25 and 26. It says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespass. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I think that's a, that's a pretty heavy scripture. And uh, expresses, again, God's heart for unity. So if you have an issue with anyone, forgiven. There's another scripture. I don't know if we use it in this lesson, but um, the, it's the instruction that if you're bringing your gift to the altar and you're coming to bring your sacrifice before God and you're bringing your gift and you realize that I have a, I have, my brother has an ought against me, has an offense against me, that it's so important to God that he says just leave the gift there. Because it's not about the gift. It's more important that you get relationship right. Then come and bring your gift. God's heart is that we have relationship right with one another. Because the power of, the, of our prayer and our being willing to humble ourselves and make and restore relationships is powerful and terrifying to the enemy. Number six, with perseverance, fervency, and earnest zeal. Your feeling is zeal. Filling his zeal. Luke 11, 9 and 10 in the Amplified. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking, it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking, the door shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks and keeps on asking receives. He who seeks and keeps on seeking finds. To him who knocks and keeps on knocking, the door will be open. So I think that's a pretty, pretty great translation to, to build in there this idea that God is after us having a perseverance and a zealousness to come before his throne with our petitions and our prayers. Knock, seek, and ask. Number seven, 
In harmony. Your feeling is harmony. In harmony. So your note says if you're married, that means not being critical of each other. If you're not married, with proper attitude towards other Christians. So again, right relationships, vital to God. 1 Peter 3, 7, likewise, you husbands dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Is that beautiful? Being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So a right relationship in the family, God mandates it, ties it to him hearing our prayers, doing all that we can to keep peace and honor in our relationships. Number eight, according to the guidelines found in the Lord's Prayer. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with the Lord's Prayer, but uh, simply presented here because the Lord's Prayer is, he, it, Jesus is creating a model. He's not creating a mantra. It's fine to say the prayer and to memorize the prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. But it's more than just the words of the prayer. It's it's use this as a model and so when you say our father which art in heaven right hallowed be your name okay so what is that right that's that sounds a lot like worship right holy and reverence is your name so so you could take and and pray the first verse and then take five minutes and just worship and you know like we learned a couple of weeks ago about david spinning around and everybody looking at him saying you look stupid and he says, yeah, I'll look even more stupid for my God. I'll be, I'll be even more undignified than this for my king. So what the heck, right? Your own living room. Just twirl around and, be, and, and just say, you know what, God, I just love you that much. Right? How, how, how about that, using the Lord's Prayer as a template, as, a, as an outline for ways that you can honor God more? So you have it in your notes. You, you know the scripture. Um, but um, we've mentioned a lot in our, that w this section is on prayer and we're supposed to pray according to the will of the Father. But the Lord's Prayer gives us one of the strongest statements about the will of the Father of any statement in Scripture. And that is, is that my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, one of, the, one of my other favorites is, is God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about that for a second. God most powerful force in the universe, is not willing, right? I'm not willing that any should die. But my will is that all should come to repentance. What does that do to your thoughts about evangelism and prayers towards people who haven't yet come to the knowledge of Jesus, right? That is the most powerful force in the universe, drawing them to him, saying, it is my will that these people have an eternal relationship with me. It's awesome. So the Lord's Prayer your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we just read the scripture. We pray anything according to his will that we already have what we've asked for. And that if we pray according to his will, two of us together, that we get what we ask for. So when we get to look at John 10:10, 10, 10, that says the enemy's job description, but then says God's job description, says I've come that may have life and life more abundantly, we can pray according to his will. So you look at your circumstance, you look at the situation, you look at whatever is in front of you and you say, well, what's life and life more abundantly in this situation? What, what's the enemy, right, to steal, kill, and destroy? What's that look like? Is that what I'm looking like in this situation? So that's clearly not God's will. And life and life more abundantly clearly is his will. So we can pray with confidence and with boldness because we know God's heart and God's will. Number four, so we are on according to the guidelines found in the Lord's Prayer, and that number four seems out of place. No, this is, this is big number four, okay. Things for which we should pray. What, for what should we pray? Long list, I won't mention this, the references, but the references are in the text. All men, especially government leaders, ministry or leadership, pray for each other, pray for wisdom, relief from suffering, pray for healing, Pray for sanctification and blessing of food. Pray to release God to action. Pray in spiritual warfare. Pray for victory over demons. Pray for personal strengthening. Pretty good list of stuff that is okay for us to pray for. 
So this next section kind of talks about that it's okay to pray in the spirit. And the praying in the spirit, we, I think the last one we mentioned is pray for personal strengthening. So this is your next fill-in. We may also pray for personal strengthening. Your fill-in is personal, personal strengthening. Pray for personal strengthening. You're feeling as personal. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do, know, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. The word edify means, it's what it means. It means to strengthen. It's actually like, stacking blocks across another like you're stacking hollow tile it's like building a concrete wall right edifies strength and shores himself up throw a little rebar in there jude 120 but you beloved building yourself up in your most holy faith praying in the holy spirit so a pretty amazing part of our prayer life to pray in the holy spirit and that it's okay to pray for your own personal strengthening and that the more you pray in the holy spirit the more you strengthen yourself I think praying in the Holy Spirit is one of the one of the pieces of God's instruction that says pray without ceasing. Because I can't always pray with my intellect and with my mind about everything that I go through, right? Because my mind's also got to be on other things, right? But I can pray in the Holy Spirit and still go about doing whatever other stuff I got to do. So fellowship him without ceasing. But pretty cool that um, our prayer language, praying in the Holy Spirit, is... It's A-OK -okay to pray for personal strength and your personal edification to strengthen yourself. Next fill-in, speaking in tongues magnifies God. Actually, maybe that's just underlined in my notes. <laughs> speaking in tongues magnifies God and edifies the one speaking. It enhances the closeness of their relationship. Need to get beyond our intellect, beyond our understanding. The result is in the revelation of his goodness, majesty, and power, which edifies us to be more bold expectant and stronger in our faith praying in tongues also helps us to pray more effectively it does indeed first corinthians 14 for if i pray in a tongue my spirit prays but my understanding is unfruitful what is the conclusion that i will pray with the spirit and i will pray with the understanding i will sing with the spirit and i will i will also sing with the understanding our prayer language gives us a greater vision of god's majesty gives us more edification personally and gives us a greater revelation of who our God is which is clearly beyond our understanding next thought no Christian is greater than his prayer life every Christian needs to have a vital prayer life okay next section uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the courts of heaven so this may be new to some of you um, but uh, I think it's a I think it's an important and a powerful concept that relatively new to the body of Christ but I think it's it's not new to scripture it's it's not new to God but it's it, there's some there's some new understanding and some things that can help us in our prayer time so number one under courts of heaven number one understand that we are an invading force your feeling is invading we are an inv invading force. Adam was an invading force. Jesus was an invading force. We are an invading force. God put Adam in the center of Eden, right? He said in a garden in the east of Eden where there were other, there were other beings around. And he says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and I want you to occupy. I want you to take from this garden and I want you to expand out of these borders and expand like bringing heaven to earth and expand heaven which in this little slice of heaven in Eden and I want you to expand it and I want you to multiply and I want you to take over the earth All right he was there to conquer and so Jesus said exactly that as well right Jesus came to conquer and to spoil all the works of the enemy and to take back what that which the enemy had taken Jesus came to do warfare Jesus came to do business didn't come to just be a nice guy 
He came to take back what had been taken from Adam and then to be able to delegate that to us. So he says exactly the same thing to us in the Great Commission. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now you go, therefore, and multiply. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's the same occupy command. It's the same military mindset. It's the same take this heaven concept and my heaven laws and my heaven lifestyle and my heaven fruits and my heaven prosperity and invade the world with it. Because anybody who follows God's laws and follows God's principles will be blessed because he's the one who wrote the rule book. So first concept we are an invading force just as Jesus and Adam were number two we are seated in Christ in God where are you seated you're seated in Christ in God so I like the I like the thought that um, sometimes I bring a chair and I just set a chair up here right we have some nice armchairs with high backs and and if you just picture the fact that I am seated in him that Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. He sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father. It's where he is right now. In reality, right now, he is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the throne of God. This is his place. And the Bible says that we are seated in Christ. And that in Christ we have authority. What authority do we have? Just picture yourself sitting on the lap of Jesus, who's sitting to the right of the Father. How much authority does Jesus have, who's taken who's taken back all authority and has been given all authority in heaven and earth. He's not lacking any authority. Jesus sits there and it's, the Bible says that you are seated in Christ. That's positionally. That's like someday I'm going to be seated in Christ. He says that the, he, who has, he who has received Christ has become a brand new creature, a, a brand new creation, and is now seated with him at the right hand of the throne. We are seated with him according to Ephesians. We are seated right here Right now, in spirit, we are seated with him. So how do you do that? Be in two places at one time. That's how you do it. You be in two places at one time. We are here physically, but we are seated and we're reigned with him spiritually. We have his vantage, we have his mind, and we are seated in him. What do you see from up there? How does your life look different from up there? When you understand how much authority that God has given us, how do you, what does it feel like to rule and reign with the Father? Do, do you just think you're a, a, do we just think that we're lesser than? And that maybe someday we'll just, we'll just eke in and maybe we'll get to be a part of the, of the crowd that doesn't, that doesn't get cast out of his presence where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. We're just hoping to skin in there by the, by the skin of our teeth? Or are, we, or are we invited to the closeness of relationship that Jesus invites us into? And that because of his righteousness, as we talked about a moment ago, because of his righteousness, that God looks at us and sees, sees righteous people made in the image of his son, made in the image of his son, with all the rights and responsibilities that go with the authority that comes because Jesus says, these are mine. What's it look like from there? What does it look like to rule and reign from sitting beside the throne of God? It's in the scripture. So where do you think you're seated? Last sentence, our role as priests bridges these two worlds. Our role as kings administrates into earth what is in heaven. We administrate in the natural what is in the spirit. So we mentioned this on Sunday that part of the church's job is to legislate, right? It's to bring and to, and to make and enforce into this current world and this current situation the principles and the laws of heaven. It's the same kind of idea. We are administrators of what's there and we're conduits connecting what's in heaven where we are seated with him in heavenly places right here, right now, but physically here but we have a connection to that, right? We, we have connection through the spirit to manifest things into the natural. What a concept. John 17, 21, and they may be all one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in you, so that the world may believe that you sent me. 
I'm in you, you're in me, they're in me, they're in you. It's, it's all together. They are, they are, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Number three, this is a, uh, this is a legal concept, but two, two terms that you may not be familiar with, but the f- terms are de facto and de jure. De facto and de jure. What de facto is, is that's the powers that are because that's where it is, right? If you come in here and you sit in here and, and you're, you got you know, your bandolier and shotgun across your chest and a sidearm on, nobody else is in here, then, and you got a badge on your chest, then you are the power just because you're the one who has the authority and the weapons in the building, right? But there's a difference between what is the de facto, what is just evident because that's what is, and what's de jure. What's de jure is what's lawful, right? The de jure is what's lawful. So there are situations in our lives where the de facto is camping in our lives, and camp, uh, the de facto is squatting in our circumstances. Picture, your, picture you've got a parcel of land out in Orchid Land, out in Puna, and you know you just haven't been there in a little while, you fenced it, you got a gate on it, but you didn't build a house on it, and you got squatters on your land that are living there. They put up tents and they're just, they're just, thank you for the, thank you for the camping spot. And yet it's your land, right? So the de facto is, well, possession is nine tenths of the law. The de facto is, is they're there and they're occupying your land. The de jure is you have lawful title. And when you go to the right lawful authority and you say to Mr. Sheriff, hey, Mr. Sheriff, would you go and please take this paper, my lawful title, and would you go and evict that it's one more step in there. I mean, you go, you go typically and you go to the judge and the judge hands you a piece of paper that says, here's my authority to go tell the sheriff to go and remove that person, right? But it starts with your lawful title, right? You are the de jure. And so much of our reality as Christians is we understand what is the de jure, what is the lawful, but we still have to displace what's the de facto, we still have to displace the squatters on the land. And that's, that's exactly what God says that we're supposed to do. That I have given you all authority in heaven and earth to you, right? But there's some other guys that still are carrying a six gun on their hip and they think they're the boss, right? But I've given you all authority. So you come to me and you get the, you get the eviction papers from the judge. Who's the judge? God's a judge. God's a judge. Nobody can mess with the judge. He is the ultimate and final authority. When he says, here's the papers, go and do the eviction, then we get the papers and we do the eviction. But that's our job, to still go and evict that squatter off of our land. So consider that little parable. It's very applicable, and there's lots of ways that that applies to our lives. So the de facto versus the de jure. Number one, the courts do exist. Contracts and covenants are the language of scripture. We're born into a world in conflict. Conflict cannot cease until the source is revealed. It's not what we think it is. The conflict that appears on the surface is not the cause. We treat symptoms when Jesus wants us to treat the cause. The courts exist, Zechariah 3.1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Hold on a second. You got Joshua standing before the Lord, and you got Satan, who's been barred from heaven, thrown out with his angels, standing at his right hand to accuse Joshua. Where the heck is Satan standing? Who let him back into the heaven that he got evicted from? So what I want to paint for you, for those of you this is a new idea for us, is that there is a very real, physical courtroom in heaven. And that's where Satan's standing. Who, who, is the, who is it that the Bible says makes accusation before us day, or, day and night before the throne of God? Satan. He's the accuser. Can anybody think of what that equivalent position is in the courtroom? Who is the one that brings the accusation exactly? So the Satan is the accuser. He's your prosecuting attorney. Prosecuting the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What is that? That's, your, that's the claim against you. That's this big old fat court case that says, Samuel, here's what you did wrong in every bit of detail. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. 
and the prosecutor comes up and he says, I have an issue with you, and I'm going to tell the judge what you did wrong. But who's the judge? Judge is, well, who is he? He's your, he's your father. Judge is your father. Holy Spirit is your advocate. Jesus is your friend, right? And he's also your defense attorney, right? So you got to, when it really comes down to it, when you think of this picture of a courtroom and all the positions in the courtroom, you're the, you're the one there that has having accusation. You're the defendant. The prosecutors bring an accusation against you. Jesus comes up and answers the prosecutor. Who answers the prosecutor? Well, the defense attorney answers the prosecutor, doesn't he? He says, uh, covered by my blood. Covered by my blood. Accusation number three, covered by my blood. He has an answer to every accusation. It doesn't mean that the accusations aren't true, that they aren't factual. But when the judge has to make a decision, and he's the judge of all judges, and he's totally perfect and just and fair. He has, when he lets the gavel down, he says, okay, well, this is what you've been accused of, Samuel. You going to answer for yourself, or do you have, what, it, what do you have to say for yourself? It comes to another point in just a sec about what our plea should be in that context. Okay, a couple more scriptures. Job 1, 6, and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. There you go again, that sneaky bugger sneaking right back into heaven. How does he do that? The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. So there's a place in heaven where Satan can legally access. He can come to the courtroom and he can bring his accusations because everything will be resolved. There's nothing that we've done, not a thought we've had, not a choice we've made that doesn't come before the heavenly father. The judge of all judges. Job 2.1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Same basic words, just different verse. Luke 22.31 and 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Where in the world does Satan get the authority to demand anything of anybody? Well, he does, because the courts have a have a protocol there are rules in the court and nothing gets by that doesn't get resolved it's not okay for God to just say okay well you know I really like I, I, I really like Samuel so I'm just gonna let that one slide doesn't work there has to be an answer to every accusation it just depends on who's gonna answer the accusation Demanding permission to sift you like wheat, continuing, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan has a place where he can come, and he can confidently come because he has a role to play. He's the accuser. He's the prosecutor. He's doing his job. So, number two, roles of the court. We've already covered this a little bit. God is the judge, and justice matters. Psalm 82, 1 through 8. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Ask that. Read that verse sometime if you get taken to court. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princesses. princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possess all the nations. You just kind of hear him just like crying out to judges, to judge like he judges, to judge in righteousness, to stand for the oppressed. Don't you hear that, that, that God is, the sense of justice is so integral to who he is and that it should be for us too. There is injustice going around in the world around us and it should, it should bother us. Right? God has different roles for each of us to, to fill, but he burns with indignation about injustice that goes around in our world. So God's, jo God's job the judge and justice matters. So if you didn't get that, you're filling with justice. Number two, or letter B, Jesus is our advocate. So you're filling his advocate. 
advocate, never another word for our defense attorney. Jesus Christ is your defense attorney. John, First John 2, 1 and 2, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sin, we have a advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus Christ is your advocate. Uh, Satan is our adversary. We already covered that. Letter D, the Holy Spirit is our intercessor and our expert witness. The Holy Spirit testifies to what is true. Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep to be uttered. D was intercessor. The Holy Spirit is our intercessor, as you're feeling. Romans 9, 1, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the expert witness who testifies always to what is true. Number three, the importance of showing up in court. Sometimes we don't show up in court. Anybody know in, uh, in Hilo, if you go to court and you're summoned to court because you were doing something audacious and harmful like, I don't know, you didn't have your, dr your insurance card in your possession at the time. So what does it mean, right? It means you've got to go to court and you've got to say, how dare you potentially harm other people by not having this card in your pocket? But if you get summoned to court and you don't show up, what happens? Anybody ever had something called contempt of court? Yeah. Then what happens? Then they, they send a, a guy with a gun on his hip. They, they give you a warrant out for your arrest that says, you need to get your fanny in court and answer for the charges that are being presented against you. So this is a very, I mean, the court system, as flawed as it is, is modeled off of God's system. I could show you that in the tabernacle system. I, I mean, they're, they're, the, the tabernacle itself, the Bible says, is a model of what's in heaven. It's just like, a, it's like an image, a foreshadowing of what's actually in heaven. This is where the template comes from. Well, the template for our court system comes from heaven. It's just that if injustice is allowed and righteousness isn't there, and if people don't know, like the verse we just read about God being the judge, if you're a judge and you're not rightly related to the judge, you might, you might think that you could use that position to somehow to your advantage or maybe not stand for righteousness or not defend those who, who are being unjustly, unjustly treated. So the importance of showing up in court. Failure to appear results in, results in contempt of court. So that's one side of it. But there's another side of it. It's in contract law. If I have a case and a charge against you and I say, hey, Greg, I got an issue with you. You need to come to court. And I show up in court. You got the court date, you got the notice all in proper order and timing, and you had the opportunity to respond, and then you don't show up, right? Then guess what? The guy, the last guy standing, the only guy standing there saying, I have this, this is the truth. There isn't somebody else standing there saying, no, this is the truth. And so it's called a default judgment. Because you didn't show up, I get the default judgment. What do you think would happen if the enemy sitting there and the accuser sitting up day after day after day and saying, I got all these accusations and we never understand there's even a court system to show up in there and, and even know how to plea? You know, in the regular court system, there's three pleas. First one is guilty. Second one is not guilty. Third one is no contest, right? That's in our system. You know, that's really broken. That's really broken. Because you ever notice what's missing in that whole plea thing? What's missing is the word innocent. What do you mean? Is not guilty the same as innocent? It's not the same as innocent. It just means that there wasn't enough evidence to actually convict you, but you're probably guilty anyway. It's the thought that you are guilty until proven innocent and still instead of the other way around. So we've had a perversion of our court system over time. It's getting farther and farther removed from God's system and accountability to him. But nonetheless, this, this thought still carries, still carries through. That one, you need to show up. You need to show up. You need to know there's a court there. And you need to show up. And how do you think you should plea? 
this might be a little, um, this might be uh, an interesting thought for some of you, but how should we plea? Uh, letter B. Did I miss any fill-ins? Let me make sure I didn't skip any fill-ins. Huh? Yeah, protocol of heaven. Sorry. Okay, so I skipped an up. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just wanting to jump ahead, uh, but I skipped a fill-in. So letter A is we have access. Your fill-in is access. We don't have to qualify to go to court. You have access. Zechariah three. Uh, you can read that scripture, but essentially it says that uh, that. God himself clothes you and makes you suitable to show up in court. He's the one who clothes you. You don't have to do it yourself. So that's the first point. Um, and Hebrews 4.16 says, come boldly before the throne of grace. So you have access to the courts. So letter B, come humbly taking responsibility. This Nehemiah scripture is really beautiful. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your ears open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night. On behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you command your servant Moses. So the thought is, is that he's taking responsibility for his sins, his family's sins, and his nation's sins. So we come before the throne of heaven, we come before the throne, and we take full responsibility for the sins. What, what plea might that be? Guilty. Guilty is charged. Guilty is charged. Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. So again, my repentance results in God's people's repentance results in the healing of their land. Doesn't say everybody in the land repented. Just says that we repented and God healed our land on our behalf. Powerful. Christ also modeled the same thing. He says, Father, forgive them. And he took all of the blame. He says, Scripture says that he became sin for you. He took upon all of your sicknesses, all your disease. He took upon all of the accusation of the enemy against He took it all, paid for it all, and literally became sin on your behalf. And he said, Father, would you forgive them? I've taken it all on myself. God, would you call them innocent because I have said I'm guilty natural tendency is the opposite it's self-justification it's defense it's no way wait no I, there's some detail that's wrong about your story instead of guilty as charged guilty as charged so letter C your feeling is agree Agree with your adversary. Matthew 5.25, make friends quickly with your opponent at law. Where? At law. Where are you at? You're in the courtroom. You're at law. While you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and have you thrown into prison. Agree with your adversary quickly. Guilty as charged. Yes, everything the accuser has said, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. My defense attorney right here says, only then, when I say I'm guilty as charged, then he can say, covered by my blood, I paid his price because he didn't, no longer trying to defend himself. He's no longer trying to bring his own defense, his own carefully plotted reasons why he's so good and how maybe there's something wrong in the, in the accusation. As soon as I say I'm guilty as charged, then Jesus comes in and says, I'm taking his place. I say that he's innocent because he's covered by my blood. Actually, it's the judge who ultimately says that he's innocent because Jesus brings the defense. It's my blood. It's my blood. It's my blood. Paid for that. Paid for that. Yeah, I paid for that too. Yep, I paid for that too. Letter D, understand covering. Our covering is a covenant with God, and blood seals the covenant. 
So just just as a real simple illustration that the idea of covering um, in the in the Old Testament tabernacle, uh, the the priest wore particular clothes when he went in to minister into the holy place, right? But then there was the then there was the incense that came came up and that acted as a covering, right? So you so they would take the the altar of incense from the holy place and this is you know share with you more detail in, in the future but they would take the the altar of incense from the holy place and they would move it once a year into the holy of holies so the whole holy of holies would be filled with this incense and this cloud of incense before and before they would go in and before the priest could go in and that one time a year minister before the holy of holies the most holy place the mercy seat where it says come boldly before the throne Come boldly before that mercy seat where God, his very presence is. We get to come boldly there. But there is uh, this idea of covering, and we need to understand the importance of covering. The law was a covering in the Old Testament. The law was. Provided a temporary covering, and the blood of animals provided a temporary, a temporary dealing with sin until the true sacrifice comes. The true, true sacrifice would come. And thirdly, the blood is a covering. The contract, the covenant, the promise is sealed in the blood. So we need to understand covering. When we, uh, I don't have a Bible here, but if you just picture just putting the word of, the, of God above our heads, like um, in, the, in the New Testament even, the, the rabbis would wear what they call phylacteries. They wear little boxes on their forehead because the word said to keep your, word always before me even on my forefront of my even on my forehead and so they'd literally wear a box in a part of their get up that, car that had scriptures in their box in the box but the idea is, is that I'm covered by his word I'm covered by his promise if you could just hold your bible over your head I'm covered by the promises of God there's a covenant that stands between me and certain judgment there's, 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 a, there's something that stands between me and this absolutely, totally righteous judge. And it's, it's his word and it's his covenant and it's a covering for me. And Jesus' blood is a covering for me. And that's what makes us receive the ultimate judgment of innocence. Okay, so next point, understanding judgment. Uh, judged to death or judged to life. I'm just going to go over this quickly. It's it's a really cool idea. I don't know the spelling, but there's two Greek words that um, that um, are translated to judge. Uh, one word is krino, and the other word is dikrino. And the difference is is that dikrino krino means to judge, and dikrino means to judge. But one means to judge to life, and the other one means to judge to death. So if you can picture your role as judge and saying that way right go to certain judgment but not all judgment is bad right we we should be eager to have god judge us like psalm 51 does where david says psalm 51 psalm 73 god would you just search my heart would you see if there's any wicked way in me because when god judges us he judges us to separate from us anything that's going to cause us to stand before him and not receive an innocent verdict Anything that we're holding up our own righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ needs to be judged and cut out of our lives. And that judgment is a judgment to life, not a judgment to death. So sometimes we get a, 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 maybe an incomplete idea of what judgment is. Judgment's not all bad. We want him to judge us. And scripture says that we will judge one day, judge the angels. So we better learn how to judge the way he judges. Amen? Okay, um, uh, just for the sake of the fill-ins, um, there's, uh, he judges to life. So your fill-in is life, he judges to life. Life, at the end of point one. Did I miss another one? Okay. Oh, the, oh i sorry, he judges to bring life. I don't know what I said, but yeah, he judges to bring life. Next fill-in. The love we give to him is simply a reflection. You're feeling his reflection of the love he has so passionately given to us. Simply a reflection. The only righteousness that we have, that we can offer, is the righteousness that he provides for us through the finished work of, God, of Christ. It's his grace. 
and um, and then okay so I shared that in the context of prayer and fasting because I think if this imprint is in our minds that there are times when we take our petitions and we just literally go up and say God I, 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 I come before your throne and I bring this before your for righteous judgment God I need an eviction order for this issue in my life can you bring me the eviction slip so that I can ask the sheriff I can ask your angels to go and enforce that in this situation and circumstance there are times when in our prayer where it's like why we're going to go into fasting next and how fasting breaks the yoke scripture says there's also something powerful about this idea of understanding what our how we can function up in the courts of heaven and what those roles are and that you've been given permission to go there and been clothed and made right to be able to come boldly to that throne and to ask for a judgment from the from the judge of all judges and then act accordingly to execute that judgment into your circumstance so I think in the context of spiritual warfare of doing battle and saying I I know that that ground is for me to take and there's barriers there's squatters on the ground on that land that I'm supposed to take God give me the give me the eviction order give me the papers give me the authority to go and act on it okay uh, third point third section fasting Isaiah 58 60 12 I know we fit a lot into this section but I I just felt like that they flowed together pretty well so Isaiah 58 60 12 awesome scripture on fasting is this not the fast that I have chosen the fast that loosens the bonds of the wick of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens to let the oppressed go free and that you would break every yoke is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh that your light shall break forth like morning your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard then you shall call and the Lord will answer you shall cry and he will say here I am if you take away the yoke from your midst the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness wickedness if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as noonday the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones you shall be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail those from among you shall build the old waste places and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repair of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in it's it's really full of imagery it's really beautiful imagery but if we understand that in this context of the scripture is is rebuking one form of fasting and affirming another form of fasting a fasting when we come with the right heart and the right spirit this is what actually breaks and it's not just it's not just because we did the ritual of the fasting which is kind of what they're dealing with here okay so you fast all the time right but where's your change in lifestyle okay so you fast all the time but where is the execution of justice into this injustice in your situation and he's saying that it's going to result in a manifestation in your physical life proper fasting is going to change you and it's going to break things and things there's going to be there's going to be there's going to be change and there's going to be refreshing because we let the the process of fasting do what it needs to do in our hearts and in our minds first and foremost to change us and that's the whole point so number one fasting is abstaining from food and drink for a time during which one gives himself more fully to seeking God you're feeling is seeking fasting is abstaining from food and drink for a time during which one gives himself more fully to seeking God so this is not a diet this is not just because you're busy and you skip meals it's taking time to fast to put your body under a certain amount of stress and then to use that time that you would normally be in preparing your meal and eating your meal to sincerely and seriously seek the face of the Father number two fasting is a discipline for today you're feeling is discipline discipline for today Jesus fasted and said when you fast not if you fast but when you fast and that's in Matthew 6 16 through 18 in Acts the leaders fasted when choosing missionaries as well as selecting elders 
Paul twice referred to his own fasting. So a normal part of the New Testament church, prayer and fasting, regular parts of their experience. There's three essential types of fast. Number one, the normal fast, you're feeling is normal, which is fasting from all food and drink except water. Pretty simple. Um, there's examples of that. Matthew 4, 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Um, there's always some practical things to be mindful of when you're fasting that we're not uh, ignorant to here. If, you're, if you are, there's issues and health-wise going on in your body, then consult your doctor before you, uh, before you choose to fast. But you ultimately do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Sometimes fasting, the breakthrough, the, the yolk that's broken is a, a, a yolk of unhealth. And, and fasting can cleanse a lot and produce breakthrough that may be needed in your life. Number two. Uh, so the first one is the normal fast. Number two, the partial fast, which is from certain types of foods. Uh, some, sometimes we call that the Daniel fast. You'll remember Daniel in prison uh, refused all of the king's dainties, and he says, just bring us our normal. This is not the kind of stuff. We're, we're primarily vegetarian in the way we eat, and this is the way. And so they, they did the whole test and said, okay, but if after so many days you're you're not as healthy as the other guys who are eating the king's stuff, then, it, then, then you're going to agree to go on the king's food. And they agreed, and God totally honored there. But it's like a partial fast, right? So I'm, I'm, in this case, they were abstaining from meat. But there may be specific things that you have a conversation with God or with your mentor about and saying, okay, well, maybe I'm not up for a, a total fast, but I sure recommend you be up. I think that's, the, that's awesome, at least a 24-hour fast. But if that's... Uh, problematic for some reason, medically or otherwise, then um, pray about maybe what God would have you give up. Believe it or not, I gave up coffee for 40 days in one of my fasts, right? So stranger things have happened. Number three, the total fast, which is from all food and liquid. So um, again, there's uh, additional medical issues there, but you grow into you grow into your length of time in fasting as well. But it's very relevant for today. Number four, the proper motivation for fasting is to seek God. Your feeling is seek, to seek God. Not for weight controlled diet or simply skipping meals. You substitute prayer for food for effective spiritual results. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So that's what we're doing. We're saying flesh, sit down and shut up. And our spirit gets to stand up and become more empowered as we follow the Holy Spirit, and we follow our spirit, and don't listen to what the flesh says. It's not going to kill you. 24 hours of that food, you can handle it. Number five, the purpose of fasting. Number one, to give yourself more fully, and more, to be more sensitive to Jesus. Your feeling is sensitive. Number two, to cleanse and chasten the soul. Your feeling is soul. Psalm 35, 13, I humbled myself with fasting. Psalm 69, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. There is, there is humility about fasting. It makes you humble. And what does scripture say about when you become physically weak? What is it that happens in the spirit? He becomes strong. You make yourself physical, physically weak so that your spirit can become, he can be strong in you. I like to say that uh, fasting takes the fight out of you. It takes the fight of the flesh out of you, and it causes the spirit to rise up instead. Number three, to have more effective prayers. You're filling his prayers. Ezra 8.23, so we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayers. Number four, to reach a higher level of faith and healing. You're filling his faith. Higher level of faith and healing. Um... This is that whole section we read earlier. You should read Isaiah 58. It's it's uh, it's beautiful on this whole on this whole topic. Number five, for effective spiritual warfare, you fill in his warfare. Uh, Matthew 17, Jesus says, "This kind 
as the disciples are troubled by not being able to cast out a particular demon, Jesus says this kind come out only by prayer and fasting. But notice that Jesus didn't pray and fast. He just dealt with it, right? But there is a, there is a foundation laid in the life of Jesus, authority that grew in him because he was humbled and submitted to the purposes of God. And prayer and fasting for us can do that same thing. We can say, listen, my spirit is more aligned with the Heavenly Father, and therefore I'm more aligned with the authority that I have over this demonic entity that's influencing somebody's life and body. And you know what? They're worth it. They're worth it. If, if you, there's a breakthrough that's needed in somebody that you care about, somebody that you have relationship with, man, it can be worth it. We've, we've often prayed and fasted as a, a, in our family in order to see breakthrough happen in our family, and God honors, God honors our fasting. So that's it for our lesson. Again, it's kind of a, an interesting meander through prayer and the courts of heaven and fasting. But I encourage you with your to within the next within the next two weeks, set a time with your with your mentor and do at least a twenty four hour fast if you're able to. Right? So it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a complete fast. It could be a could be a partial fast. It could be just water. That's what I encourage you. If you're able to do a water only fast, do that. If if not, then maybe something in, in between, you know, like the Daniel fast, something particular you can do like me, right? I don't know if I could do coffee again, right? But you could get coffee or sweets. Or there's people do all sorts of things, right? But the point is to cause your flesh to, to say no to your flesh in some area that maybe gotten a little bit comfortable saying yes to your flesh. And, the, and, and our spirit needs to get the charge of saying, you know what? He says no to the flesh, but yes to the spirit. And so our spirit gets charged in him. Connie, if you go ahead and kill the, the video, if you would, please, and we'll check the first part. All right, with that, uh, we'll leave time for questions and answers as the video is killed. But thank you for joining us on prayer and fasting and storming the gates of heaven. God bless.